Okay, can everyone see the uh, the slide? Yes, I can see it. Cool. What's the updated team? Because there's like a new. It looks different now. So that's, that's cool. Yeah, I can, it, it. They must have updated or something. All right, well, since it's 5.30, we can go ahead and get started. So, um, kind of jumping into things. Um, since this is October, this is uh, our month that we put on Beacon's big fall event called Disability Awareness Week. Um, it's basically just a week where we have a bunch of different events planned to raise awareness and, you know, about anything disability related, um, try to foster some fun, inclusive events. Um, starting off on Monday, we'll have a guest speaker, Ms. Vanessa Magnon. She's going to give a talk on deaf sensitivity. Um, it's going to be super cool. She works for the uh, Louisiana Commission for the Deaf. Um, super pumped about that. And we'll also have a give back night that same night. So, you know, go listen to a great talk and grab some great food somewhere. Um, where that will be is currently in the works. I think a squirrel just threw a pine cone at me. That was crazy. Um, on Tuesday, we'll have a safety walk. So we kind of briefly discussed that in our last meeting, but um, we, as a club, along with any other volunteers, will meet in front of the student union and kind of like split up into teams, just go around campus, make sure that everything's kind of like, you know, look safe and accessible for um, individuals who may be in need of some form of um, uh, transportation. Uh, then on Wednesday, we'll have a community organization fair. So if you guys are looking for way other ways to get involved in Lafayette, we are planning on having different Organizations around Lafayette, like Dancers of SUSP Indiana, um, Autism Society, um, Unique Fitness, things like that, just to come and kind of say like what they do, what is it that they do in Lafayette? How could you get involved? Just ways that you can help out the community. And then that night on Wednesday, October 20th, we will have a concert from Mr. Joseph Square, who is a student of the UL Life program, who has an incredible singing voice, and he's having a uh, a live band performing with him, which. I think this is going to be pretty fun. Um, so all are welcome to attend for that. On Thursday, we're currently planning on having uh, what's dubbed as Beacon Day, where we'll basically have like a bunch of fun awareness and inclusive activities um, on the Union porch. And then on Friday, we'll have our all-inclusive art show. So if you guys have been a member of Beacon for a while, you know that that's kind of like our yearly thing. It's a big fundraiser that we do for local nonprofits and for the Office of Disability Services here at UL. So we'll basically have art donated by different abled artists that we will then auction off so you guys can come buy some wall decor, buy some Christmas gifts, um, and then all the proceeds will go back to the community in some form or shape. So yeah, um, just keep paying attention to the weekly emails that Caroline sends out. She's been doing a wonderful job keeping you guys in the loop with that and any new details that we get like where the give back night is going to be or any changes that are made will be um, communicated through those. So then today's topic is going to be on developmental disabilities. And so to kind of start to preface that is, you know, what is human development? And that is a very broad answer. So basically anything pertaining to how we change or grow or decay um, from the moment we're born, certain cells in our body start to prune away. So it's not just about growth, but also how we, you know, kind of wax and wane. And it's anything to do with biological, cognitive or socio-emotional processes. So then Based off that, developmental disabilities are essentially conditions in which one or more of those three branches of biological, cognitive, and socio-emotional are impaired in some capacity that affects um, life to some degree or adaptation to life. Um, these developmental dis disabilities are typically chronic and must affect day-to-day -day functioning, otherwise they wouldn't be classified as a disability. So then the way that we find out or test for these developmental disabilities is through Developmental milestones. So, if anyone's taking like a um, human development course, like for psychology or intro bio courses, I'm sure you've probably learned about developmental milestones. So, basically, over the course of human history, we've kind of mapped out that certain um, 
body functions occur at certain periods of time. So like first word utterances are typically about three, four, six months, somewhere around there. Two word utterances about 12 months and so on and so forth. Or whenever, you know, babies first begin to walk or to have a little pincer grasp, things like that. And those are kind of mapped out fairly well. So whenever a child for some reason does not exhibit those signs that, you know, are typical at a certain age, then that's kind of indication that, hey, something may be going on here. And so that is why um, they're called milestones. So, you know, typically you can track the progress of a child, make sure that, um, you know, like their language development's going okay or, you know, their motor coordination, things like that. But if a child does not reach the milestone at the typical age, then that's, you know, indicative that there might be some underlying developmental disability. And typically the way we test for that comes from monitoring where some professional kind of just examines the child to see, you know, what's going on. And then there might be specific tests as well that they could perform to see if maybe it's just the child's just not normally exhibiting it or like, you know, like for instance, for speech, are they just a really shy child or is there actually some form of language impairment going on? And so the key for developmental milestones is early identification because the earlier you can map it out, that's when you can start begin to place um, support services like occupational therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, um, all that good stuff, special education classes. So the, the earlier you can kind of nip it in the butt, the better it'll be for later developmental outcomes. So you can start to kind of give those supports and those scaffolds early on. So then since developmental disabilities cover a really broad spectrum, of course, there's going to be quite a few. These are just some of the more um, typical developmental disabilities you'll see. Um, some of those might seem a little off, you know, because you think, well, vision parent, that's just, you know, vision. But the fact of the matter there is like our vision is tied to how we think and perceive things as well. So it's not just a physical um, condition. It's also somewhat cognitive and back and forth. Um, ADHD and is also a developmental disability and it's also kind of being understood to not only affect children. There's a lot of um, testing and research going into that as to like what exactly are we diagnosing is how is medicine working for that but that's a whole other um, can of worms for another day. Today we're going to primarily talk about um, two, one of them being Down syndrome. So we talked to this, we talked about um, Down syndrome a little bit last semester, how it's trisomy 21. So of the 23 pairs of chromosomes on the 21st pair, there's an extra one. Um, and because of that extra chromosome, there's some abnormalities in physical and cognitive development. And so that's why Down syndrome is the most common form of intellectual disability. I think that and fragile X syndrome. And so intellectual disability is once again def defined in terms not just of um, cognitive abilities like processing speed or working memory, but also how well an individual can adapt to life. And that's kind of the main um, area of treatment when it comes to things like Down syndrome is it's not so much, okay, how can we treat you know, physical symptoms, but it's how can we assist an individual to you know, cope with life, you know, vocational skills or you know, life skills, things like that. And so, so yeah, so like, like I was saying, support services and early interventions are kind of there to, and you can do um, you know, physical, um, therapy to help if there's like some orthopedic issues or you know special education classes and mainstreaming things like that are beneficial to you know education during young adulthood there's there's typically this pattern of young adults with intellectual disability that from 1 to 18 they're provided for by the school there's lots of systems set in place for them but then after 18 that's when things get kind of um, difficult because there's not nearly as many programs that specifically adhere to young adults with disabilities and so it is often the case that, you know, a young adult with Down syndrome may live with their parents until they're well into their 30s or 40s. So there's, especially in the past few decades, there's been a increased awareness and desire to provide educational programs that help independent living. So that could be through post-secondary education programs like the LIFE program here at UL, where students are given social and life skills as well as internship experience. There's also workshops done put on by organizations like Down Syndrome, Down Syndrome Association of Acadiana, where you know fostering cooking skills or cleaning, you know woodworking, things like that, other vocational skills, um, social activities to help foster you know social health, and then um, specifically independent living and vocational training is is a big one. Um, and there's also this kind of a new movement where 
this notion of like having communities of individuals with Down syndrome intellectual disability and essentially allowing them to live on their own, take care of one another. Um, Dreams Foundation of Acadiana, that is Mr. Um, I forget his first name. Anyway, Miss Danielle Watkins and her husband, they have a big dream. Wow, wow, how about that, dreams? Um, they have this goal of like establishing a village or a community for young adults with intellectual disabilities so that they can achieve independence. So it's not, I'm just living with my parents until, you know, I'm 40 or 50 years old. So to kind of give them, you know, that ability to have autonomy and to live a satisfying and productive life. The other disability that uh, or condition that I think is really prevalent nowadays is autism spectrum disorder. It's kind of blown up lately um, in terms of the prevalence. It used to be like one out of every 200 or so back in the 70s and 60s. Now the current estimate is about one in 58 according to the CDC, which that's like, you know, a very sharp increase. And so what some people are wondering is like, what kind of led to that increase? Was it some people theorize that one, we're better at recognizing the symptoms to some people um, argue that due to the way that um, like modern parenting culture works or just society, I guess, as a whole, um, that may be causing more individuals with ASD to appear um, or at least be recognized. But as we'll see in a little, a little bit, that may or may not be the most accurate claim to make. So anyway, so what even is autism spectrum disorder? Because I'm sure everyone has like heard of it. It's kind of like a household name, but actually defining what it is is a, is a little bit trickier. There's typically three main branches of it. Um, there's persistent uh, deficits in social communication and social interaction. So essentially being able, unable to or unable to read the room is kind of like the uh, layman's terms for that. So not understanding how, um, maybe how certain body language things work or not understanding appropriate um, rules of engagement or disengagement. So like how long until I've overstayed my welcome, you know, what's appropriate to say, what's appropriate to share, what's not, things like that. That's kind of like the main thing I feel like people recognize with autism. Um, the second is restricted or rep repetitive patterns of behavior. So this could be like echolalia, which is essentially like stuttering or saying something and then saying it again like in a quieter voice. That was popularized by a few uh, TV shows. Um, could also be um, sticking to schedules. That's another big one like um, Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. Like that's like something that he was known for. Um, those kind of like little quirky bits are kind of also something that's synonymous with autism. However, that's not necessarily the case for every single person. Um, also in that category is um, there may be some interest areas that are like abnormally intense. Like I've known like children that I've worked with that like trains were their thing, like trains, any kind of train, <laughs> like and that's just, you know, their thing. Um, and then the last is hyper or hyper reactivity to sensory input. So um, in the case of my little sister, she has autism and she's an absolute daredevil. So she'll just dive head first off couches no pain no, um, whatsoever. Um, other children, it might be, you know, certain materials are, you know, um, really, really, really uncomfortable. That's not to say that, you know, if you find that you have a shirt that you don't like to wear because it like rubs you the wrong way that you have autism, that's just, yeah, you know, that's, that's called a preference. Um, but in the case of extremes where it's actually debilitating to, you know, living life, like I can't wear my school uniform shirt or, you know, this, that, or the other, then that's what would lead to that third category. So then I think perhaps more important than what it actually is, is what it is not, because there's a lot of misconceptions with autism. Um, the first is that it is not new. So even though there is like kind of like this balloon of um, diagnoses in the most you know, recent decades, um, ASD was first kind of like coined in 1941, but the earliest case studies report around like 1799 of children who displayed some of the symptoms of autism. Um, it is not a social or mental health disorder. I've had, I've known people that thought it was just a social disorder, so they didn't quite understand like how did hand flapping and things like that kind of get thrown into the mix if it was just a social disorder, but it's not. It's a neurological disorder that um, currently is believed to maybe perhaps be caused by certain abnormalities um, within brain structure or other environmental factors that get introduced in prenatal or postnatal. Um, it is not a form of intellectual disability or savant syndrome. So intellectual disability being extremely low IQ, savant syndrome being that um, is really popularized by the movie Rain Man, where like, you know, a, a person has intellectual disability, but then there's this one thing they're super, super, super good at, and, like they're just a genius in math or something like that. 
that is not the case across the board. There are cases for it, but that's definitely, that's the exception, not the rule. Um, and oftentimes, um, intellectual disability can be um, comorbid, so meaning that they occur at the same time with autism spectrum disorder, but once again, that's not the case for every single person that's, uh, since it's a spectrum disorder, of course, that means that there's going to be people from all walks of life, all ranges of IQ scores and adaptability, things like that. Um, it's also not caused strictly by faulty parenting. That was a big thing, um, especially in the 80s and 90s. People thought that like cold or neglectful parenting caused autism. That's not really the case. A lot of twin studies, so um, twin study being that if one twin had autism, then there's I think around a 90% chance of the other twin also having autism if they were identical. Um, the little things like that in gene studies have kind of shown that there's a large biological component. Autism does tend to run in families. Um, so it's not strictly because like, you know, your parents didn't love you enough or something like that. That's, we recognize that it's, it's, a, it's complex. You know, it's not just one thing or the other. Um, what is not curable? What I mean by that is it's not, you know, you, just, you don't just get a shot one day or take a pill and then bam, you're good to go. Um, since it's a developmental condition, it's chronic, it's lifelong. Um, there are, and so similar to Down syndrome, the treatments for it are not so much, okay, let's, you know, get you to stop, you know, hand flapping, although some, some uh, practices like ABA do advocate for things like that. But in general, the, the focus of treatment is not so much getting rid of the symptoms as so much as, okay, let's help you to live the best life that you can, or that, you know, the most, um, I'm trying to wait to phrase that, just like, yeah, help them to live a good life, you know, help them to adapt. Um, and then finally, it's not a condition that causes people to be aggressive or violent. That's also kind of a, a negative stigma that's been placed on uh, autism as a whole. And while certainly there are, you know, self-injurious or aggressive behaviors that can be shown, that's certainly not the norm. And it's not out of malice or that, you know, like, oh, I hate people, therefore I'm going to hit them. Oftentimes, if there is something like that, like a meltdown or like, uh, like a hit or a scratch, it's due to sensory overload or just some other form of emotional distress. So, um, people with autism are not just cold or incalculable. Um, you know, they desire friendships, desire love, can grow up, raise families, whole nine yards. Um, so it's not that. There's there's a difference between not being able to un read the room and express your love in conventional ways, and then be completely like detached from that. Like that's not that's not the case at all. So yeah, so then we're gonna have our celebrity guest star, Miss Molly Gid from Down Syndrome Association of Katie to come and talk um, just to kind of give us some tips and tricks on how to be better advocates, how to be better friends, so the things to keep in mind when we encounter someone with a development disability, like how can we help them out, and then also whatever she wants to throw in, you know, a little bit of lining up for us. Hi, I'm Ollie Gidry, and I'm the media person for the Down Syndrome Association of Acadiana, and I'm very uh, pleased that y'all invited me to talk with y'all and that y'all want to know and and uh, learn about people with disabilities, especially Down syndrome. And because um, we have a big community in this area with Down syndrome and we're very active in the community. So Down syndrome was named after the doctor that discovered it. It was uh, Dr. John Langdon Down. So if his last name would have been Bernard, it would have been called Bernard syndrome. OK, so the down, the D is always capitalized, but the S in syndrome, if you're just writing down syndrome, the S is not capitalized because it's his last name. The D would have been cap would be capitalized. The only time the S is capitalized if it's in a title such as the Down Syndrome Association of Acadiana. <laughs> um, down syndrome is not who your child is. For example, I say, this is my daughter, Ellie Grace. I don't say, this is my Down's daughter, or this is my Down syndrome daughter, or this is my daughter who has Down syndrome. Just like people who wear glasses, depending upon their eyesight, could be called Mobic. You don't say, this is my Mobic daughter because she's wearing glasses. You just say, this is my daughter or my son. And when you're talking with people and um, you're, you're, doing, you know, Down syndrome to typical, not normal, because really 
nobody's normal. <laughs> Nothing's normal. So you say Down syndrome in a typical child or Down syndrome in a typical person. You know, that's how you would compare the two using the word typical. Um, Down syndrome is not a disease or a disorder. It's just a condition that they have. Um, they don't suffer from it. They're not afflicted from it. Just like you don't suffer from having red hair and blue eyes. Um, Down syndrome is an era in the cell division where the individual ends up with 47 chromosomes like the slide Wade had showed earlier, rather than 46, 23 from the mom and 23 from the dad. So there's three ways to get Down syndrome. There is trisomy 21, whereas when, you know, the mom and dad's genes came together to form the baby, there was one extra on the 21st chromosome. The second is translocation, and that's kind of, now this is real basic um, terminology, but um, so sometimes I have a friend who has, the, her son is translocation. So when her husband's 23 chromosomes and her 23 chromosomes got together, somehow in her body, her chromosomes are backwards. And when they came together, there was an extra chromosome. Okay. And then there is mobic, which is a very mosaic, excuse me, mosaic, which is the, the most high functioning, if you will, type of Down syndrome. Although there's no really levels, it just depends on the person. But that's just, um, that's like the, uh, the, this, the way we are. Wait, what's that TV show with the, um, the five Down syndrome kids, just like us, or mm, I can't think of it. It's on TLC. And it's five children or adults that they're they're um, following that have Down syndrome and they follow them around. I can't think of the name um, so that most of them are like mobic uh, mosaic mosaic because um, they're more high functioning. And, and I hate to say it that way, but there's really no other um, way to explain it. But, you know, my daughter is not mosaic, but she's extremely high functioning, whereas and I hate that word high function, but I don't know of anything else to really describe it because um, we have a friend named Ramsey and she doesn't speak, but that doesn't mean she's she's not intelligent at all. OK, so it's just how their body can function is, you know, is, is where they say high functioning and stuff. Um, People with Down syndrome go to school, they graduate, they go to college, they get married, they testify before Congress, they pay taxes, they hold jobs, some of them drive, some of them live independently, just like any typical person would. They have loves and crushes and um, heartbreaks, and just like, you know, any typical person would. And they want friends, they want to be involved, just like any typical person would. Um, the Down Syndrome Association is about 18 years old, and it was formed here um, from a lady that had a child with Down Syndrome, and she collected all the data, said, you know, hey, let's get these moms together, formed it, and we've been in existence ever since, and um, there's just always a need. We have, we serve seven parishes, but there are people from all over the state that come to our functions that we do because there's nothing past Alexandria, in Shreveport, Monroe. There's nothing up there. So they travel three and four hours to come down to Acadiana, to Lafayette, to have something for their child to do, to interact with other people, which is very sad, but it's, it's just the way it is, you know. Um, we're all volunteers. And so up there, maybe they just, you know, don't have the volunteers. Maybe they did it one time. You never know. Could It could, you know, spark up. I try to go around the state several times a year and speak with people in different areas and try to get a Down Syndrome Association up in their area. But, you know, you really need the volunteers to do that. And sometimes, they, you know, they have their plate is full. So that's just how it goes sometimes. Um, no one knows why Down Syndrome occurs. Um, it's just something in nature, kind of like a, a four-leaf clover. And so there's one little thing I'm going to read to you. So usually when you see a, a clover, there's three leaves. But every once in a while, nature says, I'm going to make this one a four leaf clover and I'm going to make this one extra special. And that's kind of how it is with a child with Down syndrome. So um, 
you know, each clover was grown in the same soil. They got the same sun. They got the same rain. They got the same people rolling in the grass on them and, you know, dogs coming over and everything. But every once in a while in that same field, you have one that has four leaves instead of three. It's the same way with Down syndrome. There's no specific way, oh, the parents did this or the parents used to do drugs or they used to drink or they used to, has nothing to do with it. It's just the way the cells come together that they have an extra chromosome. Um, but, you know, when you find a four-leaf clover, you think you're special. And so um, when you have a child with Down syndrome, we think we're special too because that was God's gift to us. <laughs> but um, there's a few other things I wanted to share with you if I have a few more minutes. Yeah, okay. Down syndrome occurs in one in 700 births. And it's getting closer to one in 600 births. And the, you know, the features are like, you know, the flat nose. They don't have a bone in their nose. They just have cartilage. They're very small nose. Their eyelids slant upward. Their ears are lowered. They have smaller features. A lot of times they say, oh, Down syndrome people have a really big tongue. No, they don't. They have a normal sized tongue. It's just their cavities. Everything is so small. It looks like the tongue is so big. And that's why sometimes you see them like that because their tongue is so big kind of like those dogs that have the big long tongues you know there's no room for it inside um but there's something else that um even though people you know with down syndrome kind of have the same traits and they look alike just like brothers and sisters look alike that doesn't mean they're going to act the same that doesn't mean that they have the same personalities the same with people with down syndrome you say oh they're always happy they're always happy because they have total unconditional love. As soon as when I was little, as soon as my mom would say, no, you can't do that, or she'd fuss at me or spank me, I'm like, oh, I don't, I hate you. I'm never gonna hug you again, you know? With Down syndrome individuals, whenever you, you know, correct them or tell them, no, instantly it's forgiven and they're like, hug. And they're just ready to go on with life, you know? Um, so they seem happy. Yes, it does hurt them. Yes, it does hurt their feelings, but they're just ready like, OK, let's go on with life. You know, instead of holding that grudge, they don't hold the grudge. So even though they can all you know, have the same features, that doesn't mean that they're all the same personalities, just like individuals, typical people that look alike. That doesn't mean their personalities are the same. Um, let's see. Some of this is the same, so I'm just reading it real quick. Um, so there was this this person that wrote this when their when their child was born with Down syndrome, and they did not know. They were in their 20s, and most births with Down syndrome are in younger people. And they say, "Oh no, it's been older people, you know, in their 50s and and you know, late 40s and for you know, no, it's only because." So let me just put it in general terms. Say in the whole world. There's only 10 ladies 40 years and older having a baby in the whole world. So three of them are going to have a child with Down syndrome and you go, hmm, those odds are kind of high, you know. But that's because there's only that many people in that age having children. So people in their 20s and 30s, there's 10 billion having them all over the world. So... When you look at that, then you've got, you know, 500,000 people with Down syndrome. You go, oh, so really the odds are higher with having a child with Down syndrome in your 20s and 30s than they are later. But it's the when you look at the numbers, it looks like it's because if people are older having children. It's really there because there's only five or six of us having children at that age. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. <laughs> So one of these parents that was in their 20s wrote this and I, I just I kind of relate it to people when I speak because it it makes you think. So if you have an encountered a person with Down syndrome or um, a family member or a close friend, it kind of makes you think. So, you know, you and your husband plan this famous vacation, this fabulous. You just can't wait to go to Paris. You learn French. You want to go see the Eiffel Tower. You want to go to Notre Dame. You, the plane arrives and you land in Holland 
And you're like, what? You get off the planes like, we didn't plan for this. We planned for Paris. We, you know, no, 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 no. So eventually, you know, they bought new guidebooks. They learn a new language. You meet new people you've never met before. And you realize Holland's wonderful. Holland has windmills, tulips, Rembrandts, chocolate. And Holland is just as lovely as Paris. It's just different. That's the same as having a child with Down syndrome. It can be just as great as having a typical child. It's just going to be different. So my daughter's 14. She just learned to tie her shoes. We were like, yes, so excited, putting the video on Facebook and everything where I learned to tie my shoes at two and a half. You know, some people about five. I just, you know, that's just not something. Her longest finger is shorter than my pinky. So they all go down from there. So imagine trying to hold all that when you're, you know, it's just couldn't. So now she's got it. Okay. Now my daughter's been swimming. She can swim like a fish above the water and under the water since she was three. So how many three-year-olds do you know that can swim? Not too many, but you know, maybe five, they can tie their shoes, but So everybody has different talents and does things at different times. It's the same with individuals with Down syndrome. They do everything that a typical person does. It's just a different time frame. So it's not going to be on your time frame. It's going to be on their time frame. And of course, if they have siblings that have uh, older siblings, even younger siblings, they're going to want to mimic and copy them too. So Um, I had a foreign exchange student come live with me for a year from Japan and she was a teenager. So she went in her room and she listened to her music. Well, guess what my daughter's doing now? She's going in her room. She's listening to her music. She's watching her iPad. The door is shut, you know, and she's just sitting there on her bed, you know, playing with her dolls and stuff. But that's what Micah did when she was here. And that's what she's mimicking that, you know, so they do everything a typical person does just at a different time frame for most of the time. Is there any questions or anything? No? Well, one of our biggest fundraisers, it's pretty much our fundraiser forever, uh, for for one time for our year, is our Buddy Walk. And it is in the month of October because that is Down Syndrome Awareness Month. And so we have this Buddy Walk going on. Of course, it is virtual this year. And we all have teams. My daughter's team name is Ellie Grace's Smiling Faces. So you can join the team. You can get the shirt. We have a shirt every year for the Buddy Walk. You can donate. If that's something that you want to do, that is great. I can email you the information. If that's something you feel like you want to pass along and maybe collect, that's wonderful too. It's no big deal. I just wanted to let y'all know because sometimes at least, you know, since working at UL, all my students are like, Miss Molly, I want t-shirts. I'm like, I got your t-shirt right here. (laughs) So this is just an opportunity I wanted to let y'all know. Um, You can always go to DSAABuddyWalk.com and you can join a team or be an individual walker if that's something that you're interested in. And hopefully next year we will be back in person and we go downtown at Park International. We walk about a mile around downtown and we have music and fun and food and all of that is there. So hopefully next year we'll be in person. But I thank you all for your time and I thank you for um, listening and wanting to learn more and help your individuals and your friends that have Down syndrome here at UL and in the community. Thank you so much for talking to us, Miss Molly. We actually have a a team planned for the Buddy Walk with the LIFE program. We'll be partnering with them. So we're super excited. Did Did they make their team yet? Yeah, I'm the team organizer. Okay, so I'm the team court captain, so you'll be getting emails from me about what we're going to do. <laughs> okay, you must have just made good. it. You must have Ma'am? just you must have just made it. Yes. Okay. Yesterday. <laughs> okay. Yes, I was. I just, I saw that there was some new teams. So great! Yay! I'm excited. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Oh, you're welcome. Anybody have any questions or comments? I don't have a question but I do have a comment. I, last semester, I got to volunteer with two events with DSAA. And oh man, that was so much fun. I highly recommend, um, just any form, any, anytime we send out something with DSAA, it's going to be a good time. I I got to help out with a cooking class and then a 
dance night. It was wonderful. So, yeah, really good so time. When it's not COVID, we're very, very busy. We're doing something at least once a month, if not two or three things a month, depending upon, sometimes we'll split up the age groups. Um, one of them that Wade was talking about was Cool I Can Cook. So we have Cool I Can Cook Junior now as well. And that's for the younger kids. So it teaches uh, the individuals with Down syndrome portion control, safety in the kitchen. And some of them read, some of them don't know how to read, but it's okay because you're cooking by color. So every fourth teaspoon, fourth cup, fourth whatever is blue. Every third is red. So all they have to do is match the color and then they can cook. Of course, that gives them a feeling of accomplishment and success. And sometimes they go home and cook for their families or for their brothers and sisters. And they're like, man, I'm one of the family, you know, I'm doing just, just like my sister, my brother. And it's a local chef that volunteers her time to do this and teach them. You can do this, you know, you can chop up and this is how you do it. And they have to wash their hands. They have to wear a little net, you know, just all safety and stuff in the kitchen. And, um, the parents are really liking it because they say uh, when they finish with the class, they're so excited they want to cook for a week. So it gives them a break. <laughs> we also do the hip hop dance party, which I think Wade was talking about. That's what you had come to, right? Yeah. And uh, that's always cool. Sometimes we do karaoke night. Um, we pa partner with UL women's basketball, UL soccer, and we do basketball and soccer clinics. And uh, so the kids get exercise, but they don't know it. So don't tell them. They think they're just having fun doing, you know, walking around the court and everything. We do a big DSAA Christmas party at the end of the year, kind of culminate the end of the year, the events that we had. Sometimes people don't get to come to everything. Like I was saying earlier, if they live in Monroe or Shreveport and Alexandria. So they come for the Christmas party and they get to reconnect with their friends. We do a swim camp and a buddy, a bike camp. The bike camp teaches the individual with Down syndrome to ride a two wheel bike in one week with an 85 percent success rate. So that is something that gives them freedom, that gives them transportation, um, that gives them, you know, I'm, I can ride with my brothers and sisters. I can ride with my friends. So it's just just things to help their life be better, that they can enjoy their life better. Um, we have music parties. Um, our friend used to own the music garden and she have like a, she called it a petting zoo for instruments and they'd get to play an upright bass. They'd get to play a whole full set of drums, keyboards, uh, an oboe, um, all kind of stuff. So it's like a petting zoo where you go and touch all the animals. They get to touch all the instruments. Um, she closed that, but she's going to be opening one up in Broussard. So we're looking forward to that. That's something they would not be exposed to. You know, and sometimes you're like, oh, they really like the guitar. Well, let me get them in guitar lessons, you know. So we do different things like that. Um, we have we, we partner with Little Jim painting with the twist. We try to partner with several people here in the community to do activities with and for them. In our next meeting, we'll be sure to share y'all's Facebook page so people can go like and follow along. Oh, great. Great. Yes. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Miss Molly. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Have a great any, any, Anytime someone pops up, just let us know. I, I know I'll I'll know I'll be there, and we'll be best. We'll do our best to show up, have a good time, and that's that. that sounds great. We're looking forward to next year actually doing stuff in person. So <laughs> the last couple of years, if y'all y'all know, has been a little different. Um, <laughs> so you know, our kids are adjusting to. And I just want to uh, piggyback one more thing that Wade said, the Dreams Foundation. Um, Donnell and her husband, Brian, they're doing a fabulous job. They do wonderful things. The Unique Fitness is part of them. My daughter cheers with them for the Dreams Foundation. Um, they're, she's doing soccer this coming week for six weeks as a little trial thing. They do softball. They do creative writing. Um, it's just wonderful. And all the money that they, you know, bring in goes towards this village that they're trying to make so that the individuals can have some independence, live on their own, like upstairs and downstairs have, um, like businesses where that they could work, you know, on like a, a, a an area a compound, if you will, 
not in a negative way, just, you know, and like have a house mom or a house dad so that they can have someone to go to if they need, but they're basically on their own and they're not under their mom and dad's roof when they get older. Absolutely. So I'm very excited to see that come to fruition. So yes. For that. Um, so yes, thank you again so much, Ms. Gidry, for coming and speaking, helping us to be better friends, better advocates. Um, at this time, I'm going to switch it over to Caroline. She's going to um, hit us home with our upcoming events. So, you know, take it away, Penny. <laughs> thank y'all. So this is going to take, so we have a couple fun events planned. Not this Friday, but next Friday, we're going to do painting day with Beacon and Friends. So we're going to, uh, it's going to be part of the Life Program's Friday Fun Day, which they do every Friday. So it's going to be lots of fun. Our only request is that you guys have dues paid by then, just to where we can offset the cost of art supplies. Or you can bring your own art supplies from home or the store instead of paying your dues. That way we all get the chance to paint and have some fun. So that'll be October 15th at 1 p.m. And then we are going to be doing the virtual buddy walk. So we're uh, partnering with the LIFE program and the Pre-Professional Society on campus is going to join us as well. And it's, we plan to do it on the next Friday, October 22nd at 1 p.m. And we'll meet in front of Randolph Hall. You just have to register for the event by October 19th so you can get a t-shirt and the registration fee is $20. So I have the link to register in the slides and in the emails and then you just have to be sure to choose to join a team and search for our team which is the ULL Life Program. And so we'll all meet together in front of Randolph Hall at 1 and walk a mile together around campus and it'll be lots of fun. And if you guys haven't had the chance to meet the life students, uh, you can meet some of them and maybe learn more about the program and all their amazing personalities and just meet new people because we haven't gotten the chance to do that in a while. <laughs> and then we're also planning on volunteering for the autism Autism Society of Acadiana's third annual trunk or treat. And so that's taking place on Saturday, October 23rd. And the actual event takes place from 4 p.m. till 6 p.m. And we've offered to help with run the event. So volunteers will be like directing the vehicles through the path, making sure everybody's trunks have candy and other various little tasks. It's not gonna be anything crazy. And, but you also have a chance to meet people and so if you're interested in volunteering, we're just trying to get a head count by you emailing or texting us. But uh, even if you end up not emailing us or texting us, you can still show up to volunteer. They just ask that volunteers arrive between 3 and 320 so they can start help setting up and get their actual volunteer assignments. Um, you're just going to receive your assignments the day of. It's not anything you have to like sign up for the day before. And they said they're not going to, like, they'll take as many uh, volunteers as that as show up. And it's going to take place at their office, which is on Pinhook. I send the address in the email, and it's also in the flyer, which I also send in the email. So that's going to be tons of fun. It's their third one, and they're really excited to uh, actually got on a phone call with them yesterday and talked about it a little bit, and they're super excited. So, And we're super excited to help. So I hope you guys can show up. And then we also need your help. If you're talented in art or anyone you know is talented with art, please donate art to our all-inclusive art show. It's really cool when we have a ton of different kinds of art. It can be anything. We've had people bring us pottery in the past, ceramics, paintings, drawings, the whole nine. And um, if you want to donate, just email ulbeaconclub at gmail.com and either Wade, Hibba, or I, or maybe even one of our other executive board members will set up a time to pick it up from you um, whenever's best for you. We're all always on campus at some point, so it's pretty, pretty flexible. And uh, that'll be shown in our all-inclusive art show on October 22nd from 5.30 to 7.30 in the Union. And then follow us on social media. If you 
our Instagram, Facebook page, and Facebook group. We post updates pretty often, and on both of the Facebook things, I like share events and things going around in the community, as well as like new volunteer opportunities that pop up last minute. So I definitely recommend you follow and like those. And then um, we also post all of our meeting recordings to Beacon Club. So if you ever miss a meeting and want to see what, what we talked about. And then our next meeting will be November 9th. And so thank you guys. Thank you all for attending. Um, stay in the loop, watch your emails, because that's how um, we'll let you know with any updates. We have a lot of events planned, a lot of uh, fun and exciting things. So hope to see you guys there. Um, in the meantime, take care. Hope you guys um, do well with tests and assignments and homework and all that fun stuff and advising. So wish you all the best. Not everybody. <laughs>